Hello, well it's not often you get a chance to see my beautiful handsome face, is it? Uh, mostly you just see my hands demonstrating the experiments or hear my voice over the microphone. But I thought we'd take a few minutes today just to look at the things that you have covered and should have learnt if you've conducted all the experiments so far. Now the first thing of course is safety. As we emphasise in many of the experiments, you do need an adult to help you and assist you when you come to things like using hot water or sharp knives. Or if you have young children around, particularly babies who love to put everything in their mouths and you're dealing with very small objects. So please be careful about the safety aspects of your experiments. Now the second thing you would have learnt of course is how to weigh things using digital scales. And don't forget always to set the balance to zero before you start weighing things. Now you've learnt about the word tear, T-A-R-E, which is of course the weight of the container. And when you press the zero button with a container on it, it's as though the container were not there. So when you put your objects in, your ice or your water or whatever it is, they're the things that you're weighing and the weight of the container doesn't come into it at all. It's brilliant, isn't it? Now you'll see this word tear quite often if you look around. For instance, take a look at the back of this lorry. Now this is one of those lorries that carries those huge containers that you see on ships sometimes. And on the back of every single one, it gives you all the dimensions and the weights of these particular containers. And there you'll see the word tear. Now this tells the people weighing the material inside how much the container weighs, so they can take that away from the total weight to find out how much the goods inside actually weigh. Now you'll have also found out that kilo means a thousand, so there's a thousand grams in a kilogram, there's a thousand meters in a kilometer, there's a thousand whales in a kilowatt. If you have both types of scales, the ones that weigh in grams and the ones that weigh in kilograms, then by now you should be getting the idea of how you can convert grams to kilograms and vice versa. So for example, 0.375 kilograms would be 375 grams. And this is quite a difficult idea to get used to, particularly when the numbers are very small. If you have something like 4 grams, for instance, you need to know how to write that in kilograms, and you'll be getting the idea by now that it's 0 0.004 kilograms. The next thing you learned was how to weigh things more accurately. And you'll remember that we did this by weighing paper. When we put one sheet of paper on the scales, it indicated that it weighed 5 grams, but that was only to the nearest gram. When we put 500 sheets on and divided by 500, we had the result correct to one decimal place. I think it was 5.2 grams, if I remember rightly. And related to that was how to find the weight of objects that weighed much less than one gram. We used pulses, or grains, or seeds, or raisins, whatever you had handy, and by putting a whole bowlful together and weighing those and then counting them, we were able to find the weight of just one of those, or at least the average. We reinforced the idea of multiplying by 10. You'll remember that when you multiply by 10, all the digits move one place to the left. The decimal point stays where it is, and the digits move instead. And we confirm that by multiplying the weight of one piece of paper by 10 and then checking that the 10 pieces weighed that amount that we calculated. And that works out very nicely. The next thing you would have noticed is that weighing scales are not always spot on. They are, after all, manufactured devices and they're not going to be absolutely perfect. So sometimes you'll put some water in a pan, say, and you'll see the number 276 grams come up, and then a second or two later it might say 275, and then it might go back to 276 again. Don't worry about those sort of things. It's not the end of the world. The maths that you're learning is much more important. And don't worry if you have two sets of scales and they give very slightly different results. If they give really different results, then there's something wrong, isn't it? Obviously, one of the sets of scales isn't working properly, but normally one gram here or there doesn't make any difference at all. It's no problem. 
Now, I did say at the beginning that it's very important to write down all your results. There's no need to write a long description of what you're doing, just a few words to remind yourself what it is you've done, but write those results down. There's almost nobody in the world can remember those results. And particularly with an experiment where you either have a lot of numbers or one that's going to be done over a long period of time. For instance, if you do the evaporation experiment, if you've done that today and you do it again in a couple of months' time and then another couple of months' time to see how it varies throughout the year, you will have to make sure everything is written down. So get in the habit of that right now, please. It's a brilliant thing to do. Now the next thing is, I hope you'll see how much easier everything is if you work in metric units. And you'll remember I demonstrated that to you with my little pet snail, Michelle. Now when we worked out how much heavier I was than Michelle, it was a huge number, wasn't it? But it was very easy because all we had to do was take my kilograms, multiply by a thousand to get grams, and then divide by the weight of Michelle in grams. And the number just came out like that. It was easy. But I don't suppose you actually tried it in ounces, pounds, and stones, but perhaps your parents wanted to go at that. If they're the sort of people that insist you should use pounds and ounces and stones and pounds for your own weight all the time, you just stick to metric units, you'll find it's much easier. But not only that, metric units show you how our number system works. You see, we've already used decimals for the kilograms and whole numbers for the grams, and by now you'll be getting quite used to changing between one and the other. You can't do that using stones, pounds, feet and inches, and all that sort of rubbish. So just forget all about that, stick to the metric units. Now, you will be seeing how evaporation works, how water just leaves the surface and disappears into the air. And you'll be getting an idea that it depends on the conditions. As the year goes on and you continue to try this experiment, you will see that it evaporates more or less in hot weather, windy weather, cold weather. I'll leave you to work all that out. But the conditions do change the amount of evaporation. Now, I'm recording this in the middle of this very hot period, very dry period we're having in the south of England right at the minute. And I have a pond in my garden which is 40 centimetres deep. And at the end of the winter, it was absolutely full, well, within a centimetre of the top. Now, the water is only three or four centimetres deep, and all of that has evaporated. And I hope you will have tried the fastest experiment in the world. How to find out how much gas is contained within a large bottle of fizzy drink. Not the healthiest of things to have, but great for experiments. So I hope you've tried that one. One of the things I find fascinating is how much water things will hold. And remember, we did two of those. We did the rice experiment and the sponge experiment. And the sponge held, well, I better not say, but it was quite a few times its own weight, wasn't it? If you haven't done that yet, please give it a go. You'll have also seen how ice cools drinks. Remember, the ice takes an enormous amount of heat from the water around it in order just to melt, and that reduces the temperature of the water and, of course, any drink that you put it in. Now, I hope you're beginning to see that maths is everywhere. Years ago, when I started teaching, way, 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 way back in the Stone Age, I was sitting in the staff room once, I was just a young teacher then, I was sitting in the staff room and my head of department, she was very posh, very posh she was, and she turned to me and she said, Mr Young, she said, everywhere I look I see mathematics. And I must say, at the time that sounded a bit strange, but now I'm a little bit older, I find the same thing, you know. Everywhere I look I see mathematics and I hope you're beginning to get that feeling already through these experiments. Almost anything in your kitchen, in your garden, in your house, in your school, well, you can find something mathematical about it. Even if you open a window, it's a rotation, isn't it? And as you get older, you've been doing a lot more work on rotations. Mathematics is everywhere. But maths is also a lot of fun and I hope these experiments are showing you just that. You don't have to do everything in a book. Mathematics isn't always about just writing everything down. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to do that at school because there's so many people in your class and it's difficult for the teachers to do anything else. But there is so much maths you can do on your own and I hope these experiments give you a good idea about things that you can try that are really interesting. Now, don't forget, some of these experiments can be a little bit messy if you're not very careful. 
If you're careful, it's no problem. But if you throw the seat about on the floor, don't expect your mum, dad, grandma, whoever it is you live with, to clear it up. That's your responsibility. And I'm afraid we all just have to learn that in life, don't we? Clearing up is part of the fun. So grit the teeth, pull out the dustpan and brush, and clear it up. Or better still, don't make the mess in the first place. Now, if you've been following the Times Tables program, the four-step program to tables mastery, which I hope you have if your tables were a little bit dodgy, by now you should be getting pretty good at those. Now, we have found by experimenting in schools that after about four weeks, most people stop doing the old ones, six is six, two sixes are 12, three, and can go straight to the answers. And many people actually double the speed. So somebody who would have done a table square in, say, 10 minutes about four weeks ago should by now be doing it in five minutes or in many cases even less. So keep up those tables and I promise you this, I really, really promise you this, if your tables are excellent, you will be at such an advantage as you go through your school life. Other children will be struggling, your classmates will be going, what, 6, 8, and you'll be going, 6, 8, 48. So please stick with it and get really, really good at that. And lastly, if you've been following the page a day maths, which I hope you are every single day, just sitting down for a few minutes and just going over those ideas, it really does keep them fresh in the old brain box, you know. And again, have you noticed when you go into class sometimes and your teacher is revising an idea, most people in the class can't even remember when they last did it. But if you do those sheets one a day, those things will always be fresh in your mind and you'll never have that problem. And you'll gradually start to see yourself going up and up and up in the class. So good luck with it all. Carry on with the next set of experiments, the times, tables, and the page a day. And, well, you'll be the best mathematician you possibly can be. So good luck, and I'll talk to you later.